Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Sebastian, and to the organizers. Um, it's a great to be back in, in Copenhagen. Um, and I want to welcome Jim again to Los Angeles, which is quickly becoming sort of longevity central. Uh, and today I'm going to talk more about our basic work. I'm a basic researcher, um, but really at the idea of studying the biology of aging and rejuvenation, which is really relevant to the X Prize uh, topic for, for this meeting as well. Um, and we tend to think of aging and rejuvenation in the context and with, through a lens of stem cell biology. And there are stem cells really throughout the body in every tissue involved in homeostasis and repair. And there are tissues that um, turn over very regularly like skin and blood and gut. And then there are tissues that turn over very infrequently <clears throat> but still have a very strong regenerative capacity like liver and like the tissue that we study primarily which is skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle is really a very stable tissue, but has a very strong uh, regenerative potential, which is just shown here. So you can actually destroy the architecture of skeletal muscle, and it will repair itself very quickly. Within a few days, a few weeks, it looks normal again. And that regenerative potential is really due to these very rare stem cells in the tissue, so-called muscle stem cells or satellite cells that exist as a very small content of the muscle. And this is just one, sh one cell shown here with this arrow in a field of muscle fibers. And even though they're very rare and they exist in a kind of a quiescent state, they have this ability to break quiescence, proliferate enormously, and rebuild the tissue. And that's really uh, kind of recapitulating development in some ways. But of course, as we age, regenerative potential of lots of different tissues is impaired. So skin wounds heal less well, bone fractures heal less well and muscle heals less well. And that's just illustrated here in studies from mice in which you can see even sequential injuries to young muscle repairs perfectly well. But even a single injury to an old mus a muscle of an old mouse, equivalent, say, to an 80-year-old human, you start to see areas of unrepaired tissue, a little bit of scarring, and a second injury produces an even more striking impairment of regeneration. So we have become very interested in kind of what causes this, what goes wrong with stem cells as we age. And we really became very interested in this in work we did in the early 2000s using this technique of heterochronic parabiosis. And so this is a technique where animals are connected and they develop a single shared circulatory system. And what was really striking to us was the fact that you could actually what appeared to be reset the age of cells and tissues. So the old partner in these heterochronic parabionts exposed to the young factors in the blood of the young animal, actually adopt a more youthful phenotype, molecularly, functionally, and they seem to repair tissues better. Whereas the young partners in these pairs, exposed to the factors in the old blood, actually appear to acquire a more aged phenotype, and they repair less well. So we studied this initially in muscle and in liver, and then uh, later in brain, looking at neurostem cells. And then over the last decade or so, this has been replicated by lots of groups and lots of different tissues, some regenerative, some less regenerative, but really showing this kind of potential for factors in young blood to restore youthful properties to, uh, to old cells and tissues. And of course, this has led to an interest in identifying what those factors might be. Can we identify youth factors from young blood that might have a therapeutic potential or age factors from old blood that could be potentially targeted um, to revert an aging phenotype to a young phenotype? And, and this has really turned our attention also to the area of epigenetics. And this is kind of a fanciful diagram from a review I wrote with Howard Chang many years ago, in which the genomic information is sort of the film, the light passes through that film and passes through an epigenomic lens to produce a phenotype or an image. And with age, you see changes in the genome, of course, but you also see a degradation of the epigenome. So this, this lens gets cloudy, producing this kind of aging phenotype. And that's the part that we think is being reverted or rejuvenated in these kinds of interventions to make a more youthful lens to produce a more youthful phenotype. And so this is also an area of interest in terms of therapeutic targeting. Can we target epigenetic regulators to restore a kind of a youthful epigenome and, and a, achieve this kind of rejuvenation? Well, these are all very interesting kinds of experiments, but really a lot of our interest has shifted away from these kind of complex parabiotic experiments to interventions that are really lifestyle interventions. Are there ways that actually lifestyle interventions or lifestyle changes can restore youthful properties to old cells? And of course, in the, in the field of aging, um, everyone's favorite lifestyle interventions are diet and exercise. Uh, and, and so we've been interested in kind of both of these, and I'll tell two very short stories, one of exercise and one of diet, which have actually given us 
uh, an interesting perspective and actually kind of different messages. So clearly, exercise has tremendous benefits for health in staving off diseases of aging, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory diseases, even neurologic diseases. And as a runner, I, of course, like the, the math of this of this article, which is kind of like the escape velocity, just keep running. Um, but runners really do have uh, something like a 25 to 40 percent reduction in premature mortality, and actually live something like three to four years longer than than non-runners. So we've used running as a as an intervention and studied this in animals, and so we've used kind of voluntary wheel running in mice, just like voluntary wheel running in humans, um, actually leads to kind of a lot of physical activity, and mice love to run on wheels. They run a long distance at night. So one of our first studies, and this was done by Jamie Brett and Marina Arjona when they were in the lab a few years ago, they just did a simple experiment is they, put, they gave mice running wheels or not, and then they allowed them to run after a period of a few weeks of running, they injured muscle and asked, how well does the muscle repair? And so we're seeing here young mice versus old mice with and without running. And you can see that the old mice show a marked improvement in a regeneration index, whereas there's very little effect of running in the young mice. But clearly, even the simple activity of running can really restore the, uh, the youthful phenotype of a regeneration of a young animal. So, um, Jamie and Marina dug down into this and they looked at the changes that occur in the stem cells. And what they found is looking at uh, the transcriptome is one gene in particular, cyclin D1, not in a cell cycle context, but in actually a transcriptional context, is high in young muscle stem cells. And as a high expression, it suppresses the activity of the TGF beta pathway. And that allows these young stem cells to activate, proliferate, differentiate. With age, cyclin D1 drops precipitously, and that leads to a derepression of this pathway, TGF-beta, which impairs the regeneration of tissues. What's interesting is that with exercise, cyclin D1 is again re-expressed in the old stem cells and restores normal um, regeneration to the aged tissue. And in fact, we could generate mice in which we could induce only cyclin D1 and only in muscle stem cells, and we could then achieve in an old animal a repair just like in a young animal. So this is really quite striking. Um, another interesting observation from this study is that we could take the blood from exercised old animals and then serious, seriously, uh, serially transfer it into old, unexercised mice and get the benefits of exercise. So this says that exercise is not just the physical activity in the muscle, but there are actually factors being secreted, again, into the blood that are having effect on the tissues throughout the body and potentially more than just on the stem cells. So this is really an area of muscle as an endocrine organ. And muscle as a secretory factor for these factors that have these anti-inflammatory pro-regenerative activities, these so-called myokines, which combat the pro-inflammatory activities of, of a variety of different like adipokines. Um, so this has really expanded our view of muscle as, as this kind of factors secreting organ um, in in, um, in age, and with exercise, you see an induction of these myokines. You see a lot of upregulation of these anti-inflammatory factors. So as part of a, a very massive experiment in which we're looking at the role of exercise in rejuvenating stem cells from the brain, the bone marrow, and muscle, we also looked at the effect of exercise on the muscle fibers themselves to ask what happens with age in the muscle and what does that change with exercise and what we found is that there are a lot of genes that are upregulated with age or downregulated with age. A few of them are reverted back to a more youthful state with exercise. And, and one in particular that I've highlighted here is a gene SPP1, which encodes the protein osteopontin, which actually has both some pro and anti inflammatory activities. But it goes down with age in, in the stem cells, and, uh, sorry, in the muscle fibers. And with exercise, it's reverted back toward a more youthful level. And so we've looked at this one protein in this context of muscle repair and aging. And this is, again, a, an effective exercise on enhancing muscle repair. But if we use a neutralizing antibody to this one protein, osteopontin, it basically ablates the effects of exercise and enhancing repair. So again, these secreted factors are almost certainly pleiotropic. But even individual factors can have a, a profound effect on the effects of exercise. So what we're working on now is actually trying to take a more a broader view of the secretome from muscle fibers. So we're using mice that are engineered to incorporate a non-canonical amino acid. So the proteins that are produced specifically in muscle 
have this non-canonical amino acid in them and can be identified by a variety of techniques, including mass spec. And so we will kind of repeat these experiments, take blood from these animals and say, what are the proteins that are coming from muscle that change with age and that respond to exercise instead of having a proteome-wide view of the, of the benefits of exercise. Okay, so just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about one study of, of diet and, and in this context of aging and rejuvenation. Of course, in the field of aging, nothing has been studied more in terms of dietary interventions than dietary restriction. And, and this is uh, some data from that early paper by Clive McKay that was mentioned earlier today showing an extension of lifespan in rats, these are actually female rats, from dietary restriction. So this really set the field moving quite dramatically, that something as simple as restricting calories could have this beneficial effect. Actually, they were really interested in growth retardation at the time, but clearly this effect has been shown to occur in animals that are fully grown as well. And of course, one can join the Caloric Restriction Society as a human. We have evidence, of course, that this works in non-human primates. There's no direct evidence in humans, but you can count your calories, restrict your calories, and, and hope for the best over a lifespan. So caloric restriction is interesting, but it's challenging. And it's hard to compare one study to another because it depends on how much you restrict. It depends on what is in the diet that the, that the animals are given. It depends on timing. I mean, even depend, I mean, you could even argue, and I often argue, which is the control? Is it the ad-lib fed animal or is it the dietary restricted animal? So we've gone to a simpler intervention, which is fasting and some intermittent fasting. And then the, the, the variable is only timing. And so this is work that was done by uh, Dan Benjamin and Peter Boat in the lab, in which they just took mice, fasted them or not, again, young and old animals, and asked, what is the benefit of fasting, again, on these regenerative phenotypes and these stem cell phenotypes? And what they found is that if you fast a mouse for a day, day and a half, there's a dramatic increase in the resilience of the stem cells. And in fact, if you take an old mouse and you fast it, the resilience of the old stem cells becomes as strong as the resilience of a young stem cell. So again, this, this appears to be a rejuvenation like we saw with exercise. You see an enhancement of this important function um, that we see go, goes down with age. But when they looked at a functional readout, so not just looking at resilience, but actually the ability of these cells to activate out of quiescence and repair tissue, they found in fact that fasting impairs muscle regeneration. It doesn't enhance it. And you can kind of understand that if the regeneration is occurring while the animals are being fasted, there's a huge you know, energetic impairment there, but that's not how they did the experiment. They fasted the animals, refed them, and then did the injury. And even after this period of refeeding, there's a marked decline in the regeneration of a tissue from a previous fast. And this effect actually lasts for many, many days. So this has really kind of turned our attention. This reflects back to, to Michael's talk this morning. Um, we really think about this now as an intervention that has a beneficial effect and a trade-off, potentially. So under normal conditions, these normally quiescent stem cells, there's sort of a balance between their resilience and their ability to repair a tissue. In the setting of fasting, which is shown on the left, the resilience goes way up, but the ability to repair the tissue declines. And this is, you know, this is an on-target trade-off. So this is not like a side effect. This is actually what fasting does. And in another uh, experimental paradigm that I won't talk about today, we've shown that we can actually put the cells, these stem cells, into a state of, of shallow quiescence, in which case they are able to repair tissues much, much better, much faster, but they lose resilience. If we put them into this high regenerative state, they actually will deplete over time. So this has really focused our attention on this idea of trade-offs, and if we come back to the idea of rejuvenation, the question is, with all of these interventions, when we start with parabiosis, as we go to these, uh, go to using drugs, or we go to using lifestyle interventions, the question isn't always, you know, what is the benefit, but what is the on-target trade-off, and will there always be an on-target trade-off that we don't see? And I think Michael referred to this this morning. When you look hard enough, what you thought was only a benefit also has a has a at least a trade-off, if not a detriment. Um, and so I think as we go forward, we will focus on this in terms of these interventions that we see affecting stem cells and regenerative uh, processes. So let me just end by acknowledging, again, the people in the lab who've done the work, our great collaborators, our uh, funding sources that have made this all possible, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>